Thank you for that family praise to God. Amen. Amen. There are many good people in the world. They want to live and let live, to be a help to their neighbors. They are morally upright, but they live with a serious problem. They're victims of an addiction. It may be the addiction to drugs. It may be the addiction to alcohol. In some cases, and these two are very serious, they are addicted to food and their weight problem is out of control. All kinds of addictions, anger and control issues, assail us human beings and we desperately are seeking a solution to our problems. And come January the 1st, these dear people believe that a New Year's resolution may help them and so they resolve in the next 12 months to rise above their addictions and conquer it. And they promise themselves and often their family, I'm going to lick this problem in the new year. I will do better in this or in that during the next new year. And they're utterly sincere. Their hearts are right when they make these promises. They mean well, but the Lord truly pities them. They look good, those promises, and our friends and loved ones hope that they will hold true to their pledges, but they don't. And in practice, these New Year resolutions usually fail even before the month of February comes. One repentant inquirer asks his parent, pastor, I always make promises to God and then end up in breaking them. I feel terrible after but I don't know what I can do to have God forgive me. Do you have any suggestions? And the pastor replied, breaking promises to God is a very human thing to do. We promise God that we will not be hateful or selfish or engage in unhealthy activities. And then we do, and we feel awful, not only because we know the act is wrong, but because we broke a promise to our Creator who loves us. Went on Billy Graham's website and someone asked Billy Graham, why can't I seem to change my life for the better? I'm always making promises to God about how I'll stop my bad habits and become a better person, but nothing ever seems to last. I've read dozens of books on self-improvement but so far, they haven't helped very much. What they need to know is the truth and to act on that truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. The truth is not the value of our own promises to do and to be good. That is not the truth. A wise writer has said, your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. This is Steps to Christ, page 47. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. Interesting, isn't it? Does the Bible say anything? about New Year's resolutions. Well, yes, it does. Israel, on their New Year, made a promise to God. They just come out of Egypt. In Exodus 12, verse 2, we know it was the New Year because the Lord had said to them about the Passover time, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this was their New Year. And shortly afterwards, they made a New Year's resolution at Mount Sinai. In fact, it was something like saying it under a very solemn oath, for they were making this resolution to God. In Exodus 19, verse 8, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. It was like Peter, who also made a New Year's resolution, although it wasn't New Year's when he did it, but it was the same time of year. In Matthew 26, verse 33, he said to Jesus, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will not be offended. And in both cases, those who made this New Year's resolution failed to keep it. Israel got right busy after that worshiping a golden calf. 
before the month was out in a mere matter of days. And in Peter's case, after his resolution, he was right at it denying the Lord after the rooster had crowed three times. He was saying that he didn't know the Savior in a matter of hours. Both of these resolutions were Old Covenant in principle. And the dear Lord doesn't want us to get ourselves involved in Old Covenant resolutions because... The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 24, they give birth to bondage. They give birth to slavery, spiritual slavery. And the little book Steps to Christ tells us what that means. She tells us why. She says on the same page, Steps to Christ 47, you desire to give yourself to the Lord, but you are weak in moral power in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. And then she says, of course, your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. So stop right there. That's the problem. The memory of your frequent failures, keep your promises, to keep your promises, makes you feel that you're no good, that God cannot accept you, that God cannot respect you. And that is a horrible, horrible slavery. Now Israel's promise, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, sounds good, doesn't it? And some dear people understand the Lord as approving of their making the Old Covenant. When God later said in Deuteronomy 5, 28, I heard the voice of the words of this people. They have well said all that they have spoken. And this is often misunderstood as the Lord's enthusiastic approval of their Old Covenant promise. But those who take this position don't read far enough. Because in the next verse, the Lord says, and he sighs. He sighs. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me. They would reverence me. They would love me, keep my commandments always, that it might be well with them. And Paul says that the old covenant produces, it gives birth to bondage and slavery, just as Steps to Christ says. And that bondage brings darkness into the soul, even though you try ever the much so harder to be good. But somebody objects. All my life I've been taught to make promises to God. Aren't New Year's promises good? You can improve yourself that way. Making promises to God is not the answer. The problem with making promises to God is that wonderful I, that wonderful ego that makes the promises. That's the difficulty with the promises. And our beloved brother Paul again sees through the problem and he says that our carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The solution is to stop relying upon that wonderful I and begin relying on the Lord's promises of deliverance. The New Covenant, in contrast, is believing God's promises to us. A New Year's resolution is not the solution to our problem of being good. A New Year's choice is the solution. A New Year's choice. Well, there are a few Bible principles that are clear as sunlight. Number one, God has never asked anyone to make promises to him. Rather, repeatedly, he asks us to believe his promise to us. Amen. Abraham, the father of all who believe, 
he made no promises to God in return for God's great promises to him. The faith of Abraham is true listening and heeding and true heart appreciation always leading to full and true obedience to God's law. The doing always follows the heart believing. And Ellen White uses the word pledge, must, when she uses the word pledge, it must therefore mean a heart commitment, a heart appreciation, the same response as Abraham's response to God's promise. He made no vain promise. He never said, Lord, I'll be good. I'll do everything just right. You can depend on me. He believed God's promise and the Lord counted his faith for righteousness. But he did make a response to believe. He did, it says in Genesis 15, he believed in the Lord and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. And the word translated believe is amen. amen. That's all that God asked Abraham to do. Amen. Abraham heard God's promise. Abraham said, so be it. And since Abraham is the father of all those who believe, he is our father, it proves that that is all that God asks us to do. Believe his promise. The meaning of the word believe is a heart response of gratitude that is deep. And the result is obedience to all the commandments of God, not through fear of punishment or hope of reward, but through appreciating the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. The very act of making promises to God is not only useless, but is far from being an innocent vanity. The practice of making promises to God is indeed harmful to the soul because whoever makes the promise becomes the source of the righteousness. becomes the source of righteousness. In other words, making promises to God is self-righteousness. And that's why God has never asked us to do it. He's asked us to choose to serve him. But if God is the one, he makes the promise. If God's the one who makes the promise, then he is the one to make us righteous. And then he is the source of the righteousness. That's why it is the Lord our righteousness and not we our righteousness. If we make the promises, then we become the source of the righteousness. And we don't have the righteousness in ourselves. The scripture is clear about that. For generations, we've assured our children, yes, the Lord will bless you. He will do this and that and the other for you, provided you first do your part. And thus the basic idea gets across that the Lord is like a policeman. He's like a highway patrol officer. He won't bother you if you keep out of trouble. Or he is like a bank that won't give you a dime unless you have made a deposit first. It's up to you to initiate the relationship with him and up to you to maintain the relationship. And if you don't, then too bad for you. He does nothing for you. The emphasis is on what you do to initiate the salvation for yourself, not on what he has done and is doing to save you. And what is the inevitable result? Attention on self, on I. And that leads to fear and alienation from Christ. And then discouragement and wandering away. Paul says the old covenant gendereth to bondage. It gives birth to slavery. It always does. It may be self-humbling to confess that we haven't taught our children the pure gospel, but it is worth the upheaval of this realization it may bring to us. It's not too late to proclaim the new covenant to those who have lost their way. And in the meantime, let's be sure to give the new covenant to the children of today. They must know that Christ is their Savior 100%, the Lord our righteousness. Amen. He has taken the initiative to save them, and he is also 
initiated a loving relationship with them, and they need to know it and believe it. Amen. And further, he maintains the relationship unless we drive him away. There's many a smoker or an alcoholic in, in ignorance has knelt, got down on their knees, and promised God with tears, God, I'll never do it again, only to be disheartened by repeated failures. It's better to pray, Father, I don't have what it takes to quit, but I choose to believe your promise, your promise to be my Savior. Thank you for delivering my soul. Now choose to say no to temptation. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace is greater than your sin. A prayer to pray for the new year. A new year's choice is to pray this prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for giving me another new year. Thank you for loving me so much that you gave your son to me to be my savior. Yes, I do believe, but help thou my unbelief. And those are the words of that distraught father in Mark chapter 9, 24, whose son was devil afflicted. And Jesus had promised him, all things are possible to him that believeth. And the poor father has set the stage for all of us. Lord, I believe, he responded. But then, and get this, he immediately begged for forgiveness. And we must beg for forgiveness because this poor man added to his prayer, help thou my unbelief. Amen. Amen. That's an appeal for forgiveness for unbelief. There is very one difficult thing about being saved. And that's learning how to believe. Learning how to believe. Jesus says in John 3, verses 17 through 19, that not believing will keep us out of heaven. I'll tell you, it's indeed very serious. And the truth is that all of us were born in an unbelieving state. You see, believing is never genetically transferred from one believing parent to a child at birth. Unbelief is natural to all of us. Unbelieving is far and above the most difficult things human beings have to learn to overcome, unbelief. It's the addiction of all addictions, the most insidious, the most pervasive. In John chapter 3, 18, we read, Jesus said, He that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And the distraught father there in Mark 9 shows us how deep this problem is rooted in our human nature, because Jesus said to him, almost tantalizing him, all things are possible to him that believeth, and then this poor man realized how awful his problem was. How every cell of his being was saturated with unbelief. And he burst out into tears. And he cried out in anguish, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now there's good news in that story. The moment that you realize that unbelief is your real problem, then help is on the way. Help is on the way. And a wise writer has said this, in the Spirit of Prophecy, Desire of Ages, page 659, a wise writer has said, you can never perish if from your heart you pray that man's prayer, help thou my unbelief. You can never perish. The people above all people whom Heaven rushes to help are those who realize the depths of their sin. Unbelief is the most serious problem in the world church. 
It is the source of our lukewarmness. It is the reason for the delay of the second coming of Jesus. And we must learn to believe how good the good news is. And the moment we say that, we remember, we remember that Christ will have a people who will overcome even as he has overcome. He did not die in vain. And he will see the travail of his soul and will be satisfied. And it is not by our works and trying hard that our robes must be spotless and our characters purified from sin. No, 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 no. It is by the blood of sprinkling. Amen. Getting close to that cross so that we feel that blood so freely shed for us. As Charles Wesley wrote in the hymn, Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely shed for me. Amen. It's all the way through the grace of God, which of course we must not receive in vain. Our own diligent effort is always simply cooperating with the agencies that heaven employs through faith in the atoning blood of Christ, says the Apostle Paul there in Romans. This marvel it's only through faith in the atoning blood of Christ that this marvelous work can be accomplished. And there we come back. We come right back to the cross of Christ again. And what is faith? According to John 3.16, it is a heartfelt response to God's loving and giving in our behalf. Amen. Faith in His blood, Romans 3.25. That is the effectual agency in righteousness by faith. Amen. Amen. And here's the definition from the inspired pen. Many accept Jesus as an article of belief, but they have no saving faith in Him as their sacrifice and Savior. They have no realization that Christ has died to save them from the penalty of the law which they have transgressed. That's death forever, you know. Do you believe that Christ, as your substitute, pays the debt of your transgression? Not, however, that you may continue in sin, but that you may be saved from your sins. You may say that you believe in Jesus when you have an appreciation of the cost of salvation. You may make this claim that you believe in Jesus when you feel that Jesus died for you on the cruel cross of Calvary. When you have an intelligent, understanding faith that his death makes it possible for you to cease from sin and to perfect a righteous character through the grace of God bestowed upon you as the purchase of Christ's blood. Do you begin to see something now tremendous in the power of that motivated faith? Not that faith itself does anything. Jesus does it. It is the Lord our righteousness. Amen. But righteousness is by faith. And what it leads to is to cease from sin and to perfect a righteous character. A thoughtful writer has said, what a wonderful possibilities there are for the Christian. To what heights of holiness he may attain. No matter how much Satan may war against him, assaulting him where the flesh is weakest, he may aside, abide under the shadow of the Almighty and be filled with the fullness of God's strength. The one stronger than Satan may dwell in his heart continually. Amen. Faith is simply making a choice motivated by the cross of Christ. Amen. Faith is simply making a choice motivated by the cross of Christ. I'd like to say that again. Faith is simply a choice that is motivated by the love of Christ's cross. Amen. Ellen White says in Steps to Christ 47, 
That must be the best page in the whole book. She says, you, what you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. The power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men. The power of faith God has given to men. Amen. Same thing as choice. See? It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God your affections. But you can choose to serve Him. You can give Him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to His good pleasure. And thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon Him. See the love motivation? Your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. Amen. Here's the simple practical ministry of the Lord. What He is doing right now in this time of the cleansing of the sanctuary. He gave Himself for our sins. But He will not take our sins, although He bought them, without our permission. He will not take our sins unless we permit Him to do it. Because the choice is forever with me, with you, as to whether I would rather have my sins than Him. Isn't that the choice? So from this time forward, can there be any hesitation about letting anything go that God shows to us is sin in our hearts? Will you let it go? When it's pointed out to you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. When sin is pointed out to you, will you say, I would rather have Christ than that sin. Amen. And let it go. And just tell the Lord, Lord, I make the choice now. I make the trade. Make thee my choice. You are my choice. It is gone. And I have something better. Jesus' righteousness. Amen. Where in the world is the opportunity for any of us to di get discouraged over our sins. Now some come here free, not realizing the depths of their sinfulness, but the Spirit of God brought up something they never saw before. And the Spirit of God went down deeper than it ever went before and revealed things they never saw before. Talk about the investigative judgment. And then, instead of thanking the Lord that it was so, and letting that whole wicked business go, and thanking the Lord that they had ever so much more of Him than they ever had before, they began to get discouraged. They said, oh, what am I going to do? My sins are so great. And the Lord has brought up sins to us that we never thought of before. And that only shows that he's going down to the depths. And he will reach the bottom at last. Thank the Lord for that. If not hindered, he will reach the bottom at last. And when he finds the last thing there in our hearts that is unclean and impure, that is out of harmony with his will, and brings that up and shows that to us, and we say, I would have rather have the Lord than that, then the work is complete. Amen. The work is complete, and the seal of the living God can be fixed upon your character. Amen. Which would you rather? Have the completeness, the perfect fullness of Jesus Christ? Or have less than that, with some of your sins covered up, that you never know of. How in the world can that seal of God's love, which is the impress of His perfect character revealed in us, be upon us when there are sins about us? He cannot put the seal, the impress of His perfect character upon us until He sees it there. And so He has got to go down deep to the deep places where we never dreamed of, because we cannot understand our hearts. 
He will cleanse the heart. He will bring up the last vestige of wickedness. Let Jesus go on, brothers and sisters. Let him keep on his searching work in your heart. Amen. If the Lord should take away our sins without our knowing it, what good would it do us? That would simply be making machines out of us. We're always intelligent instruments. We are not like some shovel or some machine or computer. We are intelligent instruments. Amen. Amen. We will be used by the Lord at our own living choice. Amen. That's faith. And that's what Paul speaks about in Hebrews 9.14. The cleansing work of Jesus. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, works motivated by ego, by the big eye, to serve the living God. Wow. That's the cleansing of the sanctuary true, Right there. Hebrews 9 verse 14. And Ellen White firmly supports this tremendous idea. She says your circumstances have served to bring up new defects in your character to your notice. But nothing is revealed but that which was in you. His eye searches every chamber of the mind. It searches every chamber, detecting all lurking self-deception. Undiscovered traits of character must come to light. God reveals their hidden defects, the moral machinery of their own hearts. In the closing up of the great day of atonement, the remnant church are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives." Unquote. The sanctuary ministry is a type of removing previously unconscious sin from the heart. Unconscious sin and the final judgment is going to disclose the hidden content of the unrepentant sinner's unconscious mind. If you are under a cloud of fear, or you're not sure that the Lord accepts you, you do not understand his discipline, and you feel like you're on the outside, and you know you have sinned and you not, do not deserve his blessings, there's the party there going on on the inside, and you feel like you've been thrust into outer darkness. The Father has commissioned his son Jesus to minister especially for you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, good news, Amen. to the poor. Amen. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Even Christ's enemies confessed that he receiveth sinners. The last page of the Bible welcomes all who are thirsty for such a Savior. David has written the exact prayer for all to pray who feel that they are unworthy sinners. It's Psalm 51. Read it on your knees. But there's so many things I must do, and I don't know how to do them all. Well, two things. Hebrews 11.6, you must believe that God exists, and you must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, Amen. that it is he who is faithful love to you. He is faithful love to you. You must believe that. But that's my problem. I don't know how to believe. I was born and bred in unbelief. Wait a moment. God has already given you a measure of faith. Amen. 
the gift of believing, the gift to choose. No one can ever say, God has deprived me of faith. No one can ever plead that. He has given you exactly the, the amount that you need for eternal salvation. Amen. Now choose to believe. Amen. Choose. But maybe it's difficult for you, as it was for that poor father, of that devil-tormented son there in Mark chapter 9. He'd come to the ordained pastors of the church, yes, the nine disciples at the foot of the mountain. This is Matthew, Mark 4. They failed to help him. He was distraught with a terrible fear. You would be too if the Lord's own disciples, some of the twelve, had pronounced, your case is hopeless. Your case is hopeless. And then the Lord appears to dangle a great blessing before him. If, if all things are possible to him that believeth, and in a burst of honesty, you make a New Year's choice to pray and to cry out with tears, help thou my unbelief, then your deliverance is, Lord, I believe. That's your deliverance. You confess the battle is raging in your soul. You believe, and at the same time, you disbelieve. Now you look in the face of that most discouraging outlook, and you make a choice to believe. Lord, I believe. And let the tears come. That father cried and he cried, and then he chose again. You can never perish while you pray that simple prayer. There is a person wiser than I who has said this in Desire of Ages, page 429. Cast yourself at Jesus' feet with the cry, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Amen. You can never perish while you do this. Never, she says. Mm. A New Year's resolution is not your solution. A New Year's choice and a New Year's prayer is. Amen. Read it. Mark 9, 24. Mark 9, 24. Amen.